Our speaker this evening is Arthur Puente. He graduated from SIBI in 1995, LCU in 1997, and received his MDiv in 2008 from ACU and is presently working on a doctorate in ministry. He was a missionary in Quito, Ecuador from 97 to 02, and has also served for a number of years as the minister of the Colgate Church of Christ here in Lubbock. For us, he has been the Dean of Ministry Training for Latin America, and for the last five years has been an instructor in the residential program. He's been married to Carmen for, for 35 years, and together they have three children and five grandchildren. Arthur is loved by our students for his thorough and thoughtful teaching of, of every subject, especially when he is, as we've learned, touched with passion by personal experiences in his life, like the fact that Subway limits black olives. <laughs> but Arthur, all, all joking aside, it is a privilege and an honor to have you speak to us this evening, so it gives me great privilege to say, come preach the word, brother. After that gross misrepresentation by Garrett, I'm not sure I want to be up here right now. But I feel I have to give a little context to the subway story, just so that if you're not aware, you will be aware, and therefore without excuse. One day I went to Subway for lunch. You know how it goes, what bread, what meat, toasted or not toasted, what veggies would you like? So we get to the lettuce, the tomatoes, the pickles, and the black olives. Well, the lady, who is an older uh, woman, I had not seen her at this subway before, she proceeded to place four, count them, black olives on my sandwich. And so I politely asked, could you put a few more on there? And she proceeded to add two more olives. And then she looked at me, and I looked at her. And I said, could you put a few more? And with the most serious face I've ever seen out of a Subway sandwich expert, she said, there are limits. <laughs> and she would not put any more black olives on my sandwich. So I told that story to our students, and so jokingly from time to time, there are limits that just keeps popping up. There are limits. There are limits. Anyway, thought I'd uh, give some context to the T-shirt. The there are limits. Uh, yeah, there are. Okay. In all seriousness, I am very pleased to be able to speak tonight. I'm, I'm honored. It has been a joy to spend these past couple of years, three years in the case of some with these students. I always feel that way though. As they know very well, I liberally give out kisses to all students when we are in the course of revelation. Not those kind of kisses, the chocolate kisses. <laughs> it's just my way of helping to keep them awake. I mean, uh, help them, you know, pass the time a little bit more. We have a lot of fun here, don't we? We as professors, teachers, as students, just as the SIBI family, we really enjoy these moments, and as you can tell, we've enjoyed them tonight as well. They are special. We usually refer to this part of the program as the faculty charge to the graduating class. It is the place and time where we usually share some scriptures and we call our graduates to pay particular attention to those scriptures that we share. And many times those scriptures come out of the letters to Timothy because there's just so much that is said there regarding ministry and living, and rightly so. However, since I've already covered the letters to Timothy and Titus with our graduating class. I thought I'd do it a little bit different tonight and focus our words from the Sermon on the Mount, from Jesus Christ our Lord. And so tonight's message will be a reflection on Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. 
Sermon on the Mount really isn't what we would normally call a charge kind of passage. However, it is very much in line with the idea of a certain way of living, living the kingdom life, living as citizens of the kingdom. And so these two are very important for us today as well. So with that in mind, I hope that the words that we focus on tonight will find encouragement for all of us. And of course, anytime we focus on the words of our Lord, we're in the right place. Let's hear this section of scripture. I tell you, therefore, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor. They do not spin. And yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things. But your heavenly Father... He knows that you need them. Rather, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. In this moment of Jesus' sermon, the Lord is talking about what disciples should not do. Oftentimes it was couched in the way of what disciples should do, but here we get these words in a negative way up front. Do not worry, Jesus says. Worry. Think about that word for just a moment. The mere mention of the word worry probably is enough to make us think and reflect on our own lives. What's going on in our lives right now that we worry about? What is it that perhaps we haven't quite found an answer to just yet that we're worried about? Maybe something that keeps us awake at night. If Jesus were to ask us today this question, what are you worried about? How would we answer him? What would we say to the Almighty Lord? More importantly, what would he say to us? Would Jesus' response be the same as what we read here? The same as what we hear in this passage? Most likely. Yes, I think it probably would. The answer he'd give us would probably sound a lot like the words that we just read. Words that he gave to disciples standing and sitting right in front of him. Disciples who had worry, just like we sometimes have worry. The Lord begins by saying, do not worry about your life. Do not worry about what you will eat, what you will drink. Don't worry about your body, what you will wear. And then he says this, is not life more than these things? And of course, we would have to answer in the affirmative. Yes, life is worth more than just these things. Life is about more than just these things, right? But with so many things in life, we do find ourselves worrying, fretting perhaps, thinking about. Again, how is this going to work? What are we going to do? What's the answer? 
It seems that the more we live in this life and in this world, it's easier to become more and more worried. But it doesn't change the fact that the Lord says what he says. I think worry implies the idea that we've allowed our problems to become bigger in our minds than what we should allow them to become. Worry simply means that we're focusing on ourselves too much. We're focusing on our dilemmas too much, on finding human solutions to the needs that we as humans have. Jesus directs us in a different way. He says, fix your eyes and your heart and your minds on God. After all, if God has given us a life and a body to begin with, both of which are more important than food and clothing, will he not also give us all that we need to support that life? And again, we have to answer yes. This is the implied response to his question if we're paying attention. It is an overwhelming yes. Yes. So worry and fretting or being fearful, which is the root meaning of the word anxiety here, to be anxious or to worry, all of those things betrays a lack of faith and trust in God to provide for our needs. As one wisdom writer put it, jealousy and anger shorten life. Anxiety brings on old age too soon. God has given us our lives and our bodies. He will also provide what we need. The emphasis here is on what God does, not on what we do. God provides for our needs. Jesus illustrates this care and provision of God in beautiful ways. He calls the disciples' attention to the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, or as some versions read, the wild uh, wildflowers. First, the birds of the air. Jesus says, consider the birds of the air and how God cares for them. It sounds a lot like Psalms 104. That entire psalm is just a testament to the care and concern of God over all of his creation. It's a beautiful psalm. Here's what part of it says, beginning in verse 10. Speaking of God, the psalmist says, He makes springs pour water into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to the beasts of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the sky nest by the waters. They sing among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The land is satisfied by the fruit of his work. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. And that's just a sample. God supplies what his creation needs. Always has. Always will. The birds do not sow, Jesus says. They do not reap. They do not store. Those are things humans do. Those are things that we are involved in. That is our activity. But not the birds. They're not concerned with these things. And there's a simple reason why. Jesus says, because your heavenly Father feeds them. And we need to let that sink in. Hear it again slowly. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Again, Jesus emphasizes God's actions, what God does. We should focus our attention on that as well, shouldn't we? On what God does, not on what we do. 
And notice the special relationship that Jesus, our Lord, highlights here. He says, your heavenly father. It is such a special relationship that we enjoy. He is our father. It reminds me of the way one of our grandsons talks about his grandmother, my wife, Carmen. Several of our grandchildren call her lovingly, Nini, Nini. They say it with such joy, Nini, Nini. Just recently she went to Virginia, Virginia to be with our uh, daughter and grandchildren over there for a while and she got off the plane, they come running towards her, Nini, Nini. Oh, hi, Grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> but the sweetest thing is how one of them, John, our grandson, refers to her as my Nini. My Nini. I love you, my Nini. My Nini. That's the sense I get here. Jesus says, He's your father, your father, our father. Jesus himself would say, my father. That's a special relationship that we have. And that's what Jesus is calling here for us to make note of, to emphasize, to not forget. It is the relationship that is so precious to the father that he provides all that we need. He is our heavenly father. It's so beautiful. This fatherly care that we enjoy that's what should make anxiety feel, well, unnatural. When we embrace this idea of our loving Heavenly Father providing for us, what happens to anxiety except that it disappears? Worry, because we know that our Heavenly Father cares for and provides for all of us richly beyond measure. And I wonder Jesus asked this question then, are not, are you not much more valuable than they? Now this question implies a positive response. He's really saying, you know that you're more valuable to God than the birds, right? And notice how God cares for the birds. How much more does he care for you? How much more valuable are you than they are? Good question. We do know that, right? We understand that, right? He follows that question with another question where the implied response is a negative one this time. And he says, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And of course, again, our answer, well, no, we cannot. Contrasting questions, of course, to point out that worry has no positive benefit in the life of God's people, no matter which way you look at it, in a positive light or in a negative light. Worry has no place. It accomplishes nothing, maybe even makes the situation worse. Our efforts in worry cannot prolong life, cannot extend life, cannot solve life's problems. It does us no good, perhaps only does bad. And so, graduates and all of us here tonight, hear this part of the charge. Remember that you are cared for and loved by the Almighty, your and my Heavenly Father. That's what we shouldn't forget. But Jesus is not done yet. He now presents the lilies of the field, the wildflowers. And I love the picture that either Janet or Pearl or both put up of the flowers all over the place. They're fitting for several reasons. The flowers of the field, what a beautiful image. We've, we've all seen them, haven't we? Driving down the highway, we see all of a sudden fields of wildflowers. They dress up the grass, don't they? Colors of purple and yellow and pink and white. Always beautiful, always stunning. How beautiful the clothing of the grass is. That's what Jesus says that the flowers are. And here's something that's more beautiful even than that. And that is 
that God is so attentive to his creation, to even this detail, he provides richly for the grass of the field. Not even Solomon was dressed in such splendor. And notice, we're talking about the grass of the field. Jesus says, the grass which does not last very long here today, but gone tomorrow, burned quickly. And yet, in its brief and inconsequential lifetime, even the grass enjoys God's rich provision of beauty and honor. There is no detail missed by the Almighty. He provides for it all and for all of us. And so if God is so attentive to the needs of creation, is he not more attentive to the needs of humanity? You see, a short-lasting faith forgets this truth. But a faithfulness which lasts, on the other hand, remembers that we are his children and we are worth everything to him. So don't worry, Jesus says. The pagans run after all of these kinds of things. One translation says that these are the kinds of things that the people who do not know God keep thinking about. But your heavenly Father knows you need all of these things. There's a difference, isn't there, between those who do not know God and those who do. We have this conviction, but they don't. Therefore, we should live in this way. And to top it all off here at the end, Jesus says, if you want to direct your energies in the right place, don't worry about these things, because God has always provided for the needs of his creation. But dedicate yourself to the following Invest yourself in this. Give it your all here. And this makes up the second part of our charge to all of us tonight, but especially to our students. Fully devote yourself to his kingdom and to his righteousness. That's it. Know that you have a loving father that provi who provides everything you'll ever need and get everything you have about yourself and devote yourself to him, to his kingdom, to his righteousness. And Jesus says, all of these things then will be added unto you. And I love the way he phrases that because if you pay attention, it's in the passive voice. These things are added to us. We don't get them of our own action. We receive them by the Almighty's action in our favor. They are added to us. Humans are passive while God is active. We've heard that story before, haven't we? He is the one who provides for us every day. So, to conclude this evening... Live in the present reality of being loved by God today. Jesus says tomorrow will take care of tomorrow. So we shouldn't even worry about that either. The Father's already there, already at work in tomorrow to provide for us well into the future as well. It is unknown to us, but the future is fully known by God. We should entrust ourselves to his care on a daily basis. And on a daily basis, God will provide for us as we dedicate ourselves to him, his righteousness, his kingdom. To be sure, and we all know this, every day has its own challenges, yes. But it also has its share of loving blessings. Whatever evil might meet us, there is an overabundance of goodness and mercy to meet and overcome that evil every day. Trouble is met by peace. Need is met by full provision. Worry is overcome by trust every day. And so tonight, we, the faculty of 
SIBI commend our graduates into that loving care and provision given by our Heavenly Father on a daily basis to serve Him, to seek His righteousness and kingdom purposes with all your hearts, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And remember, the next time we all see flowers in the fields or birds flying in the air, we should hear Jesus say to us again, your heavenly Father provides for you. So cast all your worries aside and trust him. There are no limits to his care for us. May God bless us.